Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Time for another Ask a Crafter, and we're gonna start off with a really interesting question from Carrie. She asks, how do you handle bad customer service from an art supply company? Have you ever had this happen and how did you deal with it? And she went on to explain that she had purchased a product that did not work as advertised. So uh, the first, uh, I kind of follow up the chain, chain of commands unless I could see that it's a manufacturer's defect. And in that case, I would just contact the manufacturer, show my thing, say, look, this isn't this is not right. There's something wrong with it. Um, I always send photos and I explain what I think should be happening with the product and what is actually happening. Like for instance, I had purchased a set of Derwent Lightfast off Amazon and one of the colors, a really pale color, had a dark um, streak in the core and I couldn't sharpen it off and it kept leaving a streak if I was coloring with it. And so I took photos of the pencil showing the core. I, I showed how it swatched out, sent those photos to Derwent and explained my situation because I knew that um, like if I if I contact the Amazon, they would just be like, send the whole set back and we'll send you a new one or something like that. And like, I don't need that. I just need that one pencil replaced. And um, so they were like, yeah, no problem. And they sent out the pencil. And I think most manufacturers will do that. Um, you know, if you can demonstrate that that there's clearly a defect in that um, in that product, they might even want to know the serial number so that they can catch or, or some sort of product code so they can catch like that batch that's got those that may have um, inferior product. So unless it's 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 a clear manufacturer's defect, I would go first to where I purchased the product and said, uh, I'd like to return this. It does not work as expected. Um, and ask if you can have a refund or replacement if you want a replacement for it. So if you think it's just like you ordered this product, you're excited to have it, just doesn't seem to be working and you suspect that there's something wrong with it, they could also send you out a replacement. What would happen with them is they would probably put in a, um, uh, they might put in like a request to the manufacturer to re to reimburse them for that product. So that that's how I would go either way. If I got a if if I was given a hard time about a product, if it was an expensive product, I would probably you know keep at it. Um, in you know there are consumer protections for you for this reason if it's like an expensive product if it was something for a few dollars I might just let it go but I probably wouldn't order from that company again that tends to be my my um, mode of course if I'm treated poorly by a company and I don't think it's a fluke if it, it seems to be like a repetitive thing or how they they treat people or if you talk to different people and you're all always treated bad by this particular company or you see them treating other people badly then I just don't buy anything else from that company there's a couple companies on my list that I just do not buy anything from because I think that they are um, they're shady. Uh, so that's personally how I deal with it. Um, luckily, I've never had a problem with a product being faulty and not getting a, um, a replacement for it. So um, so if that happens, geez, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what to say beyond that. I guess I'd probably let it go if it wasn't too expensive, but I would be wary of purchasing from them again. Uh, Julie Ann Torrens asks, in-person teaching. I'm starting to go back to teaching small groups, safe numbers with masks. Do you find it better to charge less and have a supply list uh, folks should bring or charge more and have the student kits ready to go? Starting with beginner watercolor painting and I'm going to have them bring what they have and have extra paper on hand. Uh, nowadays, right now, while we're in a pandemic, I would suggest that um, that the students bring their own supplies. I'm sorry, I am so fidgety tonight. I'm kind of, it's kind of late, so I'm like, I'm, I wanna like sit on my feet. <laughs> Um, because we're in a pandemic, I would suggest that the, that the students bring their own supplies. That way you don't have to share supplies and even risk any sort of, um, you know, virus spread or anything if anybody was sick. But um, generally, if I'm doing a cra if I'm doing a workshop, it depends on where I'm teaching. If I'm teaching a mixed media or craft class, generally I will supply the materials and um, charge uh, per person fee. If it's a fine art class and I'm teaching it like a, in my own studio, I would be char I would have them bring their supplies and I would charge a fee and not necessarily less. It's kind of like the level of the instruction is what you charge for. Um, so like when I go to conventions to teach, I'm expected to bring everything the students need because um, there a lot of times they're traveling. They don't have uh, space to have all their own supplies, so I bring everything. But I um, but I do charge more for those classes because there's so much product being used, and I have to travel, and it's it's kind of a more elaborate project. But if it was in my own studio, um, the prices would generally be the same whether I'm supplying or they're supplying because I don't supply. 
I supply projects for like uh, craft and mixed media classes, but I don't supply products for like a series of watercolor or a series of oil painting classes because I expect them to paint on their own. If they're taking a like a course from me, there are things they need to be doing on their own to build their skills between classes in order to get the fullest amount for the um, uh, for the the price they're paying. So um, that's how I do it. You can do it however you want. I think students are more likely to commit and keep coming back to classes if they own the supplies. So if it's something that doesn't entail a bunch of different media, like watercolor for instance, then I think it would be acceptable to accept them, to expect them to bring their own supplies and to charge a fair amount for your time. Uh, but if it's something like a kid's craft class or a, a mixed media class where you're trying something different every week, it would be practical to expect them to have that many supplies when they may be taking that class to explore different media and then be able to kind of settle on what they like best. Um, after that class. And then you could branch off to doing like an oil painting class or a pastel class or a watercolor class, which they would bring their own supplies to after they had that kind of taste draw all those different materials. So, you know, it's a personal choice, but that's how I do it anyway. And that's worked well for me over the years. Um, Mel B asks, I appreciate your giving information regarding the consequences of crafting choices. For example, glitter, mica powder, etc. Could you tell us about the consequences of heat embossing? Since it involves melting plastic granules, it must affect air quality, right? Am I creating toxic fumes in my house when I heat emboss? Well, Mel, um, of course you have to do what you're comfortable with, but I don't think it is, um, I don't think it is a big concern because for one thing, you're just putting a very, very fine layer of that powder on your um, on your stamped image, so it's not a lot, and you're heating it, and it melts so fast. I think it's probably very similar to using a hot glue gun, but if you're not comfortable with it, then, you know, then don't feel like you have to use it. You could always use foils, you could use glaze pens, other things to get a raised or a fancy effect that doesn't involve melting plastic if you don't want to. I mean, you don't even smell that much like you would if you were, um, you know, melting, uh, you know, other plastics, I guess, you know, it's not a very big, not a very strong smell. I don't think it's, I don't think it's that big of a deal. And when you do see smoke, it's usually because your paper might have a little bit of moisture in it and that's what is making the smoke. That's just my opinion though. We welcome yours as always. <laughs> Um, Renee asks, my question is about how to develop a neat, unique and recognizable style. Now, I think I, I actually answered this one before, um, but you will develop your style just by just by working and just by constantly practicing and working. It will develop. There's no way to create it. I don't think it just happens. Mary Beth Duncan asks, uh, your kids are on the cusp of college and moving towards adulting <laughs> away from home. Do you have visions of how your job and art making will change? For example, will empty nest alter your crafting routines? I ask because my kids are in similar are similar ages. Thanks. I love your channel and your creative energy. Absolutely, yeah. I definitely think about this a lot. We had an addition put on our home la uh, at the beginning of last year, and it has always been. Um, we tore our old garage down and uh, put in a new foundation because it wasn't stable to build on top of it. And we put a, a two-story addition. And the second story will, it's currently master bedroom, but it will be my art studio after the kids move out. We'll move back down into the, um, sorry about that. I'm gonna try to turn that noise down. Um, we will move our bedroom back down to the main house and then that will be my art studio because I want to be able to teach from home and have students in my home, but not in my living space. Um, and also we have a heated garage if I wanted to do workshops and have larger, you know, tables out and stuff, I would have all that space. That didn't turn anything down on my phone. Huh. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely thinking about that. I'll probably do more in-person teaching. Um, I might do more convention teaching. I'm not sure. I just, I would do convention teaching like once a year, not a lot. Um, maybe some retreats. I'm not sure, but definitely some more in-person teaching because I'll be able to clear that headspace. I'm not sure if I will go back to teaching children. I used to teach children a lot, but I don't, but I definitely did not have the patience for it after my own kids were born. I, well, after the twins were born, I did still teach kids after Jackson was born, but, um, but then when it was the three of them and they're less than two years apart, it was kind of a little crazy. Um, and I just didn't have the patience for teaching children. I don't know if I'll go back to teaching kids, to be honest. Um, I don't feel a desire to teach children anymore, um, which is, I know it kind of sound, probably sounds horrible, but, um, but, but I've had enough of kids. 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but no, not kidding. Uh, I think I'll probably just teach adults, but but that's definitely something I'm thinking about. Probably a little, little traveling teaching, a little teaching in my home studio, um, and also the online teaching. My gosh, that's a noisy phone. How did I manage to turn those? No I usually have my phone silenced. I don't know what's going on. Life is crazy. Um, but yeah, that's definitely what I'm thinking about. It is uh, definitely going to be a different season of life. How many times can I say definitely in this video? But, um, but yeah, it's exciting too. You know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be exciting to have kind of those chunks of my brain back that are constantly spinning on what are the kids up to? What are they doing? What do they need? <laughs> you know, it'll be uh, it'll be good. I think it'll be good. Um, let's see. Um, Maggie has a question about using alcohol to paint with chalk pastels or soft pastels. Um, it, it wasn't on a video of mine. I don't think she was wondering if it might have been one of my videos that she passed by. It wasn't, but I often will use water to make washes in my pastel backgrounds. So, um, yeah, I don't see why you couldn't use rubbing alcohol if you wanted to, if you're worried about your paper warping. But to be honest, I use water and I don't have an issue with my paper warping. I do tape it down first. Um, so yeah, you can use either. I can't imagine why why that would why that would be much different. Um, I tend to use water because a I figure fewer fumes are better, and b I don't know if the alcohol might uh, have some sort of acidic effects on my paper or degradation on my paper over time. So you know, water's a little bit safer. Um, and the Tool Girl forty two has a question about stamping on tissue paper, rice paper, parchment paper, etc. I love to make my own backgrounds for collage work. I've used several different kinds of permanent inks, archival stays on Versafine and random pigment ink, and for some reason it bleeds about a minute after stamping. The delicate lines and numbers on music notes, for example, are difficult to see. Um, well, my uh, my trick for this is to not stamp on tissue paper. Stamp on deli paper. You can get twelve by twelve sheets of deli paper from. Um, an office, uh, not office, a restaurant supplier. I bought mine on Sam's Club on uh, online. I don't know if they have the big sheets in store. They do have the smaller sheets sto in store. It's also called dry waxed paper. If you're, if you're not, uh, if you can't find butcher paper, what's it called? No, it's called deli paper or dry waxed paper. It's like a crispy tissue paper. It's, it's really great for stamping or jelly printing because it's got a little bit of, um, resistance in it to uh, to the moisture so you don't get the bleeding and feathering. I probably would use stays on or I would use, um, actually I think you could probably use anything. You just gotta make sure that it dries. So I would test, uh, I would test on one because I mean you get like a hundred or 500 or something for like 10 bucks, it's really cheap. Um, probably not even that much. Uh, I would test it to make sure your ink doesn't smear. You'll probably need to heat set it or emboss it to make it, uh, to make it dry because it almost, it's it's a wax, uh, it's not, it doesn't feel waxy, but it's got that crispiness to it. So it's probably got some sort of um, coating on it that may make some inks not dry very well. So just test it. And if it doesn't dry, then heat set it or something. But that's what I would recommend. You're going to get a much better effect. And I think it's just as cheap, if not cheaper. Um, and let's see, we'll finish up with this question from Arteria's Arts at Provost. I'm sorry, I probably butchered that. Can you unmount red rubber stamps on foam? Uh, if so, what kind of foam and how is this done? I have several videos on mounting rubber stamps, so I'll try to remember to link them below. But if not, if I forget, type in the, the search box on YouTube, Frugal Crafter, how to mount stamps. And um, I use a product, if I'm going to mount it on foam, I use a product called Easy Mount. It's the letter E, the letter Z, dash M-O-U-N-T. And you just, there's a sticky side and there's a cling side. So you peel the backing off the sticky side, you stick the rubber stamp down to that, and then you trim around it. I usually will do a full sheet at a time and then I will dust it with baby powder because it is so sticky. And when you cut them, when you cut out your stamps, it can like stick to your scissors and it's kind of a pain in the butt. So, um, so that's what I do. Uh, I often though don't even bother with that. What I do is I take the red rubber and I paint on the back of it with Aliens Tack It Over and Over, which is a repositionable glue. I let it dry and then it's sticky and it and it I never have to redo it. So I mean, I have I ever had to redo any? I don't know. It lasts a long time. Works great and it's way cheaper than the foam. And if you want to unmount stamps, I recommend using a microwave or a heat tool to warm up that rubber and foam and then just peel it right off the block and you should be good to go. And that will do it for this episode of Ask a Crafter. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Until next time, happy crafting.